You're listening to the Lou Stokes Podcast. Real and inspiring conversations with individuals from all over the world, sharing their insights in sustainability, fashion, conscious consumerism, and empowerment. Be inspired to take action and be the change you want to see in the world. Hi, and welcome to the Loose Stokes Podcast. Today I have with me Sasha Kamili. Welcome, Sasha. Thank you so much for coming on to chat with me today. How are you? Hi, Lou. Thanks for having me. I'm doing good, thank you. So happy to be here. Amazing. So before we get started, why don't you just give us a little bit of a background about what you do? I know you work in vegan and ethical fashion and you're a writer and a speaker, but I'd love us to give a bit more context to the audience. Of course. So I have a background as a fashion journalist and copywriter, and it was about... Uh, well, it was exactly 11 years ago that I made a transition to a vegan lifestyle. And while I was doing this, I noticed that there was a lot out there about, well, there was already quite a lot about living as a vegan, but it was all, all the information that was available was based around food. And I was working in fashion at the time. So I was really interested in learning more about how I could combine my love for style with my new ethical values, which weren't that new. Like I've always been massively into animal rights. It's just that I realized I could go vegan, so I did. Um, So I actually started a digital vegan fashion magazine called Vilda Magazine that I ran for six years with uh, people on my team from all over the world. I also left the fashion industry about uh, three or four years into being vegan and started working Mm -hmm. with PR at PETA, which is one of the biggest animal rights organizations in the world. And I also wrote a book called Vegan Style, which came out uh, a few years ago. And it is, well, I like to refer to it as the first vegan book without any food in it. That's not, so <laughs> not not like exactly true. There are a few uh, restaurant recommendations in the travel chapter, but what it is, it's a book about all of the non-food aspects of living as a vegan. So there is Amazing. fashion, beauty, travel, decorating your home um, without any animal derived products. There's a tiny little section on menswear as that is still a big gap in the market. Fashion brands, mm. if you're listening, vegan menswear is, a, is there's still lot, lots to do there. And mm-hmm. now uh, what I do is I host a podcast called Catwalk Rebel, which was sort of born from my story of seeing injustice in my industry, which was fashion, and taking steps to making meaningful change. Uh, and mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. what I focus on on the podcast. I talk about uh, talk to people who also work towards change in the fashion industry, and I also share some of the knowledge that I have gained through the years about why you know why I personally don't wear animals, but also other topics such as shopping secondhand, which I think is very important. Well, that was yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just interested. You talked about in your intro, how you were working in fashion and then you turned vegan. How did you feel at at that transition point? So you're working in this industry and at that time it was way less sustainable and ethical than it is now, right? So I'm just wondering what what was the turning point there that made you realise I need to move away from this and, and change, like have meaningful conversations and more meaningful work aligned with your own morals and ethics? Well, it was sort of a gradual process in the sense that I've always sort of felt like some aspects of my beliefs were completely out of line with my Mm. line of work. Already when I was at Fashion University, I tried to come up with ways to have this conversation. I was the only person in the class who was outspokenly against fur I was always suggesting uh, for our projects, I would always suggest to do something that was based around eco-friendly launches in some way. My final dissertation was about beauty standards and the harm that they cause to consumers. 
And I was often met with an attitude of, you can't think like that. There's no ethics in business, which is really funny <laughs> if you consider the conversation in fashion now and how that has evolved on that front. But also yeah. when I started working for online retailers and I was on the editorial side of things, so many times I felt like I had a double life. During the day, yes. I would essentially, my job would be to sell all of these products that I would never wear myself. All of these calf skin bags and, you know, lizard skin shoes and all of those products. And in my free time and on the weekends, I would be volunteering at dog shelter. I would be writing blogs for animal rights groups. So I really felt like I was not really aligned with yes. how I wanted, mm -hmm. uh, where I wanted my, um, my time to be and my skills to contribute towards. And I think the change came when I realized that I could actually do this as a job. And that is when I moved to London from Milan and I worked, well, I didn't work. I volunteered at PETA at first. And <laughs> I realized that this is something that people actually do as a job. Uh, I grew up in Sweden and things are different there now. But back then it was like we had a couple of animal rights groups and most of them were largely volunteer run. So I thought, okay, this is just something that you do as a volunteer. Or if you do mm -hmm. end up working in an organization like this, you have to have some sort of animal degree or something like that. And I thought there's <laughs> no space for someone like me. But then when I saw the PETA team, that people came from all kinds of different backgrounds and used their transferable skills to contribute to the cause, I thought, okay, maybe, you know, I could actually take some of the things that I've learned in the fashion space and use it here. So that's how that came about. And already, like during my first week at PETA, I felt like, okay, yes, this is it. This is what I should be doing. This is where my, my people are. And it, it just felt like so many things fell into place. That's amazing. And what is exactly you're doing at PETA? PETA? Um, well, I am uh, responsible for spreading the message about our campaigns in some of the European markets that we work in. I um, work on a lot of our fashion campaigns, as that's my background. I do some of the special projects that we do, such as, for example, I worked on um, a collection with a fashion brand of a few, I think we did a few t-shirts, sweatshirts, and a phone case with animal rights messaging, which is, you know, like a funny, lighthearted way to get people thinking about mm -hmm. the issues. And I also guest lecture at universities around the UK that have fashion courses. Uh, and I talk about our fashion campaigns and the ways that um, animals are exploited in the fashion industry. And I also talk a lot about material innovation. So I bring some samples of, you know, leather made from pineapples and, mm. and corn and cactus and apples and things like that and show the students which is always um, a big hit especially among design students but yeah those are some of a uh, few of the things that I do yeah it's fantastic um how how do you feel like mentality has shifted from you know from you know when you first started with the vegan fashion to now like, are people more open to it? Do you feel, like, how are you feeling about that? Or do you get people that qu question you about fur? Because I've heard people that say to me, yeah, but if you're from, let's say Russia, a really cold country, using animal fur is what keeps us warm. And they, you know, it's kind of like their way of, um, I don't want to say excusing, but, you know, they're justifying, oh, why were they wearing it? You know, because there's not other materials available that can actually keep you that warm. You know, I was actually born in Russia, which is so confusing. I oh. was born in Russia. I grew up in Sweden. And there's so many countries in the mix. So I remember at fashion school when uh, one of our teachers asked us, like, is there anyone here? I don't remember why he was asking us this. But he asked, like, is there anyone here who's against fur? And, like, my hand just shot up. And at first, for a few moments, I was the only one. And then other people were like, me too, me too. Uh, and, wow. and the professor said, you know what? This The only person here who actually like comes from a culture that really justifies fur was the first person who said she was against it. And I think, you know, mindsets have, have shifted hugely uh, in the years that I've been in this space. It obviously depends on 
what culture you're in. Uh, I think there are some cultures where some materials are still seen as more acceptable. But uh, I think that mm -hmm. there is um, progress happening in those countries too. It's just just everyone is on different timelines when it comes to, uh, to progress like this. Yeah. And we have to remember that, you know, things like, for example, when we have explorers who are climbing mountains in extreme temperatures, they, they don't wear a mink coat to do that. Uh, they wear technical um <laughs> fabrics that are much more uh protective from the elements than fur is it is a status thing this is why uh we yes uh, you, know, mm. we, uh, you know people in some countries still cling on to it but it's a very tiny tiny clientele still left and this is um uh, evidenced by the fact that the brands who still sell fur are you can count them on one hand pretty much every big name in fashion from gucci prada burberry to chanel Versace, Michael Kors, Alexander McQueen, um, Balenciaga, you know, I could sit here all day and just name brands that have publicly distanced themselves from fur. And this is also why we at PETA sort of, you know, we still work obviously um, on some aspects of the fur campaign, such as we work uh, towards a ban on sale and import of fur in the UK. But largely we are setting our sights on other materials now because the battle with fur we consider that to be largely won uh, because there isn't yeah. really a fur debate anymore in fashion it's just seen as something you don't do the ceo of gucci right. said that fur is not modern a few years ago so that's <laughs> sort of right uh, but even when it like outside of the uh, the fur industry there is so much evolution happening in how vegan fashion is seen when I first launched the magazine in 2013, people, like so many people were just really confused by what, by what I was doing. People would say, what do you mean vegan fashion? What, there's no meat in clothes. Like people wouldn't <laughs> know what I was talking about. But now we have, um, Hermes has made a bag from mushroom leather. Mm -hmm. Chanel and Hugo Boss have worked with pineapple leather. H&M has put pineapple leather and grape leather in their conscious exclusive collection. We have over 400 brands who have banned um, Angora from their ranges. Exotic skins are being banned by brands such as Burberry, Victoria Beckham, Paul Smith, Mulberry, Chanel, so many others. Um, we have Vegan Fashion Week, which is happening in Los Angeles every year. So just the fact that vegan fashion has stepped into the mainstream, people are aware of it. And it's actually a, an industry buzzword now. That's what has changed. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's fantastic that, you know, slowly but surely it's kind of being left behind. And so many, especially luxury brands that, you know, have a powerful voice, that they're standing for something different. Um, what are some of the alternatives to fur that, that brands are using? Well, one really interesting um, development that we've seen is Ecopel, who's a faux fur manufacturer from France. They have developed something called Koba, K-O-B-A, and that is a faux fur made from corn. So it's mm -hmm. partly made from uh, bio-based materials. It emits 63% less greenhouse gases and uses 37% less energy than conventionally made faux fur. And that is just one example of how we as humans, we can improve our practices if they're not perfect. We had this, you know, petroleum-based variety of faux fur that was perhaps not ideal from an yeah. environmental standpoint, although it should be pointed out that it's it's still not as polluting as using animal fur but even so we can improve what we use we can make better things uh we can innovate but killing an animal will always be taking the life of someone who does not want to die and there's just no better way to do that there's no way we can improve that so there is a still a long way to go but we've come so far yeah no it's it's so good it's so good to hear that there are all these incredible alternatives as well. What is one of your favorite materials, you know, new materials, let's say, for like leather? So I just got, for my birthday last week, I got uh, a bag from a brand called Frida Rome. They mm -hmm. are uh, a 
British brand. Um, they won Dragon's Den last year and they got investment. So they, like, they're they really getting bigger and bigger. And they use cactus leather, which oh, is wow. produced by a company called Deserto in Mexico. They mm. use the nopal cactus, which grows locally in Mexico. It requires almost no water um, and it's much less harsh on the environment than both producing animal skins which is part of animal agriculture one of the leading causes of the climate crisis and also it's much better than using pvc or pu or all of these plastic derived materials that aren't you know exactly kind to the planet either so we have these materials that are coming out that are amazing but one material yeah. that i also think is really interesting and that will the truly groundbreaking is the world's first vegan leather that's entirely plastic free. So one criticism that vegan fashion has faced is especially coming from the fur and leather industry saying that, you know, this, this vegan leather that people have now, it's all just plastic and it doesn't buy a trade. <laughs> well, one thing we have to keep in mind is that animal leather is not plastic free. So, you know how the industry likes to say that leather is biodegradable? Well, biodegrading is just a fancy word for rotting. It just means that something rots, which is something mm. that happens to all natural fibers. But you can't have the jacket rotting while it's in someone's wardrobe. So to preserve it, animal leathers are treated with lots of really harsh and toxic chemicals. And they're often coated in plastic. So unfortunately, right. fashion just isn't very plastic free. Plastic is pervasive in so many areas in fashion. But this new material called Mirum, that's M-I-R-U-M. It's made by a company called Natural Fiber Welding in the US. And they have found a way to weld plant waxes and oils together without using any plastic at all. They're very secretive about what actually is in this material. We, we just know that it, it's plant waxes and oils and it's derived from various materials. But we know that it's entirely plastic free and can be biodegradable in certain conditions. So once again, innovation is moving forward. And in a few years, we'll have leather grown in laboratories. I think there's so many more exciting things coming in this space. Yeah, absolutely. The whole material innovation is, yeah, it's an incredible. Like recently, each week you're seeing something new of the way different items are made. And yeah, it's incredible. Absolutely. So how, Sasha, for someone that, you know, kind of at the beginning of their sustainable fashion, vegan fashion journey, how easy is it for someone to start to create a more vegan wardrobe? Well, it's easier now than it's ever been before. I remember when I was first getting started in this space, there was, I mean, there was a lot, but it wasn't very, it wasn't very sustainable. It was all like fast fashion that was animal free because it was cheaper. But today there's so many amazing ways to, to shop. Um, first of all, like I would advise most people to shop secondhand if you can it is the most ethical way to shop and we have so many clothes we have enough clothing to dress the next six or seven generations already on the planet today and we're producing yeah. so so much and it's causing things like i saw a statistic that every second the equivalent of a garbage truck of textiles is either burnt or sent to landfill so wow. that is, it's terrifying. Just think about mm -hmm. it. Just the time that I've said that sentence, it's, it's mind blowing. And the only way to avoid this is to reduce production volumes. And that's something we can do by uh, choosing to shop secondhand as much as we can and moving away from the mentality of always having the latest trends. I'm sort of against fashion trends. I think we need to move away from yeah. the mentality of this is in, this is out. Um, and when it comes to finding vegan options, there is a lot of places you can go. Um, one of my favorites, uh, destinations for shopping vegan is immaculatevegan.com. They are very oh, yeah. high-end marketplace for vegan fashion. I think they're absolutely amazing. 
Another one I love is Bear Fashion, which is curated by an amazing vegan stylist called Rebecca Roy. She's also doing um, fantastic things in the in this space. I've interviewed her on my podcast as well. And at PETA, we have uh, the PETA Approved Vegan Scheme, which is something that we've introduced to help brands showcase their vegan offerings and help consumers identify vegan options. So it's a logo that brands can use on their uh, in their communication, on their products, both online and uh, in physical retail. And if you go to either pita.org.uk or just pitaapprovedvegan.com, you can find the full list of over a thousand brands that offer vegan options. So it's easier than ever to get started. No, great tips. And, um, you know, shopping secondhand is great, but, you know, but what if there's just as I'm just curious to see what you think, like if there's a leather jacket secondhand, like that's obviously not considered vegan because it's an animal product. Exactly. Um, yeah. So if that happens, I think that there are a few options there. Um, I think that obviously buying anything secondhand is always better than buying a new leather jacket. Um, right. Because you're not contributing to demand and you're also taking something that already exists um, and using it, which is always positive. Personally, I don't feel comfortable. I remember it was a few years ago. I was looking for a winter coat. And I found this coat at a charity shop. It was it was beautiful. It was such a gorgeous coat. Mm-hmm. And I didn't check the label. I don't know why I didn't. As a vegan, you're so used to reading labels all the time. Right. But on that occasion, <laughs> I just didn't. And when I got home, I saw that this coat was actually like 10% wool. And it, it broke my heart. I just, it was such a letdown. I remember just seeing that and being like, no. I just... I, I, I cannot do that. After everything I've seen, after seeing 15 PETA investigations of over 100 wool producing facilities and cruelty so horrendous that sheep shares in Australia and in New Zealand have pled guilty to charges of cruelty to animals, I just couldn't, you know, stand in front of university students in that coat and talk about how easy it is to shop vegan and shop ethically. So I actually took it back to the shop. But I also think that from my point of view, like if someone else who wears wool buys that coat instead of buying a new wool coat, that's definitely a, a progress. And this, I think, is ties in with something I get asked all the time, which is what do I do with the non-vegan clothing that I already have? <laughs> yes. in the situation Because you find out all the information and you're like, oh, wow, but actually my wardrobe is full of this stuff. And there's a few options here too. You could, you know, go to a swap party and just give away of of your non-vegan clothing. Um, You could donate it. Although I think we should be mindful about donating clothing because with all of the, you know, the amount of clothes in circulation and with the trend Mm -hmm. uh, mindset of, you know, this is out Uh, People donate so many things constantly to charity shops who are just overwhelmed with clothing. And sometimes those clothes end up in third world countries where they either threaten local production or they're sent to landfill. So we need to like Mm -hmm. donate mindfully if we can. Um, Or, you know, if it's fur that you have, we at PETA have a fur donation program where people can send their unwanted fur coats. And we use them in educational displays, in our protests. We send them to homeless people or refugees who we believe are the only people who have a justification for wearing fur. And we also give them to animal shelters for bedding sometimes. Or you know what, if you have a controversial opinion coming up, if you have a leather jacket or a cashmere jumper that's, you know, several years old, you've had it for a long time, you can just wear it until it reaches the end of its lifespan and then you can replace it with something vegan this doesn't make you any less vegan it just makes you less wasteful and that's what the planet needs all to be so i think there's absolutely no shame in doing that yeah absolutely great points i've had students say to me as well when they start to become more aware about sustainability and stuff they're like horrified and they're like well now i need to get rid of all my clothes and I'm like no absolutely no, not keep wearing your fast fashion stuff yeah just keep wearing it um 
don't throw it away (laughs) and just you know become more mindful and conscious the next time you actually go to purchase something um I'm like you I I always encourage people to shop secondhand where they can or buy from sustainable ethical brands um but yeah it's very easy to be like oh nothing I have is ethical and I'm gonna get rid of it all and it's like well actually no now you're on this journey just do the best you can and like you said if you have a cashmere jumper keep wearing it until it becomes you know until it comes to the end of its life exactly Mm -hmm. yeah I think we need to be more we need to treat our clothes differently just see them differently and respect the space they have in our lives and the memories that we've created with them, which will make Mm. it more difficult to be stuck in this, you know, throwaway mindset of, Mm. okay, this is something I wore on this occasion and that's it. And now I need something new. There is so much of this chasing after new things all the time. And I think that is so key in having a more sustainable fashion industry because we cannot be talking about like whatever materials we use or if we use you know produce in a solar powered factory and things like that and use less packaging that's all great but it's like those fast fashion brands that release 50 collections every year as long as we're doing that this can never actually be sustainable. And it's not just fast fashion. I noticed the other day how luxury fashion is all about, you know, there's a lot of talk about sustainability, but there's, it used to be just autumn, winter, and spring, summer collections, but not, but now it's cruise, it's resort, it's couture, it's yeah. men's shows, it's pre-fall. It's all of these, you know, more and more collections coming out constantly. And This is something we need to address if we want a better fashion industry, this constant influx of new things that nobody really needs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's part of capitalism, isn't it? Until we deconstruct the system, people are just going to keep on consuming and things are going to, you know, new things are going to keep being made. And, And back to your point about, you know, people keep buying new stuff. I feel like there's this addiction to having something new. It's like that, like it's kind of like you get an endorphin hit when you buy something new. And then like a week later, you're not, maybe not even that really bothered about it because that feeling has gone away, right? And then you're kind of searching for the next one. But I was talking um, to someone the other day, actually on the podcast about how, when I shop vintage and I find like a gem that maybe I've been like trying to find it for a while, or I just come across something that I'm like, wow, this is amazing for me. That gives me a boost. And I think the more you do that, you know, the more you like treasure hunt as it were in charity shops, in resale sites, um, in different, you know, places where you can buy secondhand, you know, and sustainable brands and you become more knowledgeable about what is really going on. Because I think a lot of people, they don't, they're they're disconnected from their clothes. Like more people are, you know, more conscious about their food and their their diet and nutrition now, but clothes, people are still very disconnected. And so I think the more like people like you and I are sharing all these different, you know, all this different knowledge and ideas and different ways of, of being and, buying and consuming fashion and becoming more ethical and more conscious about it I think that's also when we're going to see a lot more of a shift which we are already seeing of course we are but it's still you know still a way to go definitely um I think a large part of it is also the communication around uh shopping there's still you know magazines Mm -hmm. and websites that have all of these you know, approaches about what's trendy. You see these articles like must haves for this season and you're like, okay, but must I really have that? It's just something that's just arbitrarily made up and what celebrities are wearing and also with social media, what influencers are wearing. Um, I think yeah. specifically young people who are so impressionable and who constantly see people they follow on social media wearing new outfits constantly it really plays yes. into that obsession of I have to have that. And 
Yeah, absolutely. There's still, I, I love the fact that there is a bit of um, a different attitude towards rewearing, for example. We've had celebrities on the red carpet rewearing outfits they've worn yeah. before, and I love that. I think that is so, so, so big. And it might seem like, okay, this is a rich celebrity. They can wear whatever they want. It doesn't make any difference. But normalizing keeping something in your wardrobe and being seen in it many times, I think is important because otherwise we're stuck in yep. this constant cycle of new things and the addiction to the new is just being fed constantly. And I also like what you said about shopping secondhand. I, I do feel like that is so much more rewarding sometimes when it comes to finding something because yeah. it is like a little treasure hunt and you don't know what you're going to end up with. It's just, I think it's so much more fun than just, I yeah. don't even remember what it's like to shop on the high street anymore, but like just going to a shop and just trying something on and just, okay, I need this, I bought that and that's it. I think it's just so much more exciting yeah. to kind of, you know, end up with that special gem that you might not, never have seen otherwise. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked on secondhand shopping, whether it's charity shops or, you know, resale apps such as Vinted and Depop and all of those. Yeah, me too. I love it. I, yeah, it's it's fun. It's definitely fun. And it's also like, I wonder who wore this before me and what story this item has, you know, it, it has some, it has a deeper meaning to it. Especially with vintage items that, you know, have been around for a while. Um, yeah. It's always interesting to imagine like what, what these clothes have been through and what their story is. It's Yeah, I think it's, yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah, it's beautiful. So, Sasha, how do you envision the future of fashion? Well, I really hope that people see animals differently. I really hope that people begin to view animals as individuals and mm. realize that behind every must have accessories such as for example her every Hermes Birkin bag it takes three crocodiles to make just one uh, Birkin bag and crocodiles might not be animals that we communicate a lot with but if you imagine that this is an animal who felt pain joy love fear just like your dog at home they were curious they were playful they wanted to live their lives just like anybody else and when we start to see animals in that way as individuals who just want to experience life the same way that we do it's just it's just not not justifiable it's a no-brainer to mm. step away from wearing them and I, I hope there will be more of a questioning of that uh, I spoke to a journalist a while ago who said that it is completely accepted in fashion industry to talk about things like deforestation or child labor, or human rights violations. But talking about animals is still, there's a big taboo around it. And I hope that the future of fashion will see us break that taboo. And I also hope that, like we've discussed, this um, way of producing this much clothing will be slowed down. I remember mm -hmm. once yeah. when I had a magazine, I wanted to launch like a digital vegan fashion event. Um, and have brands showcase their new collections on the magazine first. So I remember I went to a, a shoe brand and I said, um, do you want to show your new collection on my magazine? Um, and they were like, what do you mean? We don't really work like that. We don't have collections. We have our range. And then we, sometimes we add something or, and we, or we remove a design based on customer feedback and what, what sells and what doesn't. But we just have our basic collection. And I think if we move towards a model like that, that would be revolutionary. But for that to happen, mm, we need to yeah. shift our mindsets around how we view fashion. And that's something that I hope will happen in the future as well. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sasha, for coming on. It's been amazing speaking to you. Thank you so much. For can you tell me. our listeners where they can find you? You're welcome. Can you tell our listeners where they can find you, your podcast, your Instagram, etc.? Absolutely. So you can check out my website, sashacamilli.com 
for lots of different resources. There's a blog, there is uh, my podcast is on there. Um, some of my, my outfits with all of the links to what I'm wearing. And you can also download a free ebook on finding your personal style with advice from stylists. And you can also follow the podcast on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. It's called Catwalk Rebel. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Sasha Camilli. And uh, the podcast is also on Instagram and Twitter at Catwalk Rebel. Yeah, I think that's it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sasha, once again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. Ciao. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please subscribe to the Loose Stokes podcast. Rate and review in the Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're tuning in from. I'd be so grateful. Also, check out the show notes to learn more about my guests and learn more about me on my website, www.loosestokes.com. Until next time, be inspired, take action, and be the change you want to see in the world.